Hi, I'm Sabella Court and welcome to Virtual Open Day. We're here shooting at the Society Inc. today. This is my design studio and also my retail store. And I'm going to share my love of history and how I include it in my design process. So when I left school, I started a history degree. It was part of the BA at Sydney Uni. Um, I did it because I love history. I didn't know how I was going to use it and how integral it would become in my design process and my design career. So I studied Australian history, both Indigenous and European settlement. And since then, I have collated an enormous library, well, an ever-changing and ever-growing library of beautiful books that I reference all the time. My favourite time in history when it comes to design and architecture is Georgian history um, in Australia and that's around the 1850s and onwards. But I collect all these books. I refer to um, some of the secondhand bookshops like Berkelo and I ask them to source books for me. So I'm going to show you a few so you can see how I do my research. So this is Georgian architecture in Australia. I do like to refer to Australian um, homes. I love Australian history. So a lot of my first port of call as such is what was happening in Australia. I've got early colonial homes. And then, oh, this was a great one that I got because I love words as well. And I love having the right words to be able to explain what I'm talking about and how to start my research. So I have this one, the American Heritage Dictionary, and this has got lots of fantastic old words that are still relevant in the building architecture and design world. But I don't just stick to Georgian times and the 1850s. I go into all sorts because each project is so different and what's so exciting is to, well for me, is research and going down a bit of a rabbit hole into another time. So this is one of Karen McCartney's books on the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, I've done projects on Art Deco. I've done pro so many fantastic projects with different times in history. Of course, I refer to my own books. And then these are some of my favorite too, the Victorian catalogues. Now, these are great. They have, this one's particularly on hardware because I do love hardware but it has fantastic illustrations. And this can help you with your fabric choices, your motifs, your patterns, even down to what the menu looks like in a bar or what a textile design actually has an image of. And this one's fantastic because not only does it have some of the smaller items, it has, until I find them, furniture and beds and tabletop things and all sorts of stuff. So you can actually start sourcing your product that looks directly like a certain time. This is Victorian, but the catalogues that came out at this time are really interesting and the illustrations are beautiful. Now, if you can't start your own library as yet, there's lots of resources, um, including your own school, but also there's a fabulous one called the Caroline Simpson Library that's part of the Sydney Living Museums. It's a design library. You make an appointment and you can tell them what you're looking for and they'll go through their incredible archives and help you get the information that you need for your project. And they, I have them on um, speed dial and I'm very friendly with the librarians and it's a great relationship to start. Over the years, I have collated an object library. Now these are all the things that I've collected and sourced and bought over 27 years of styling and designing and it becomes my reference library. Now it makes it very easy for me to, if I'm designing a product or I'm putting a storyboard together, I can reference the things that I've found and loved. So it might be about the patina, could be about the shape or it just could be about storytelling. And there's something about choosing things that are old, lots of things that I have are old, that we know through history that they're tried and tested and they are going to work. So here are a few of the things that I love. They're random. There's a beautiful wooden pulley with a brass inner. There's an oyster shell. I often cast these for some of my hardware range. There's an old wooden peg from some kind of shipping vessel. I'm not sure what it did, but I love it. Old stencils. Even some old um, bull clips. And these are some beautiful bricks from a Haveli in India. Now, all these things might seem random, but I do use 
things like these objects to inform my design process and the materials that I use in a lot of my projects. So other than my cabinet of curiosity, I also collect people and those people are heritage trades and crafts people. Um, I have a black book of makers, dyers, blacksmiths, ships, shipwrights, weavers, embroiderers, seamstress, all sorts of people that I collaborate with to make my projects better and have that handmade feel that I love. So for example, this one is a piece of leather that's actually been dyed by a leather dyer. Um, and we made this pattern up for a project that I did at the NGV. Um, some of the pieces that my blacksmith works on with me is even um, this sample was for the curtain rails that I'm making out of zinc and brass. He also will make up, I'll just grab it down here. He'll make me up beautiful profiles. I have a thing for profiles and that's why I really reference some of my favourite Georgian architecture as well of what these profiles would look like. So this is done out of zinc. But those trades make my projects so special and not only is the reference to, to history and that steeped in nostalgia look that I love, is then that heritage trade gives it another layer. So collect those people, they are vital to your design process. How to summarise my passion for interiors? It's quite hard to put it into a nutshell, but I think one of my favourite sayings is stay curious. And that's something that I have done my whole life. My mother showed me how to look at the detail of life and it really intrigued me. And I really it took a while for me to understand that you can gather inspiration from anywhere. So with this curiosity, you gather the inspiration. So you could go for a walk down the beach or go to a national park. You might pick up a feather or a monarch butterfly or a shell, and that could be a whole color palette, a whole interior. You don't have to go to far flung places or buy the most expensive book to get inspiration. You could go to an art gallery and see a color combination, and that could be the inspiration. Inspiration to me comes on a daily basis and I do gather moments and objects and then I put them into my library of my imagination and then later I'll rearrange them to become an actual space. But that space doesn't have to be as big as a hotel or a restaurant or a high-end residential home. It can be as simple as the space you create for yourself, like my beautiful shop, which gives me so much joy it has its own little library of inspiration that is just, just for it, just curated, just for this shop, whereas other projects have their library for their inspiration. So I suppose that also summarises my process, my design process. So my design process would also be that library and collating of information that sometimes stored right in the back of my brain that takes me a while to find it again, but I do use photographs and objects to jog my memory and spark a story and I collect portraits and stories of people I read extensively and although I can't remember all these things they are part of my lifeline and they do get I do tap into them all the time so the interiors that I do design are part of my storytelling and that layer and that essence is just you know, embedded into what that final design is. Back in 2009, I was asked by Karen McCartney, who was the former editor of Inside Out magazine, to do a six page decorating story in this issue. And what I did was come up with three boxes of different objects and materials that I collected and then those objects created the interiors. I'll show you to give you an example. So here are the three different colorways and then inside is the indigo blues one, the more monarch inspired one and then a beautiful powder room feminine design that I did there. Now to run you through the theory I get a small box 
I like a small box because things have to fit in this and you can store it on the shelf. I know that seems quite simple, but when you get quite a few of these, that makes sense later. Now, to come up with a palette, and this is really great for residential interior design and the design process, and you can work with your client on doing this, or you could do it for your own home or relate it to commercial interiors as well. But let's look at how it looks in the residential world. So you could ask your client to gather some of their favorite things. It may be a cocktail ring, an invitation, a photograph of one of their favorite artworks. It could be a scarf. It could be a favorite toy of a child. It could be across the family, but they have to gather at least 10 items and then pop them in the box. It can be more items. This one I did for my paint range, but we can imagine that this is a client. So in this box, we have all sorts of things. We have a beautiful oyster shell. Let's move this. We have um, some Japanese wrapping. Looks like it's from soap. Some beautiful ribbons. Some indigo dyed thread. Oh, it's quite a large roll I have in there. And then we have some pieces of fabric, some borrow pieces of fabric, and some of my favorite scribbly bark from the gum tree. And an old milliner's flower. So these are some of the objects in this box that we then color match. So the theory is you can come up with a 10 color palette so from these objects, you then color match them to a paint color. Although the paint color only represents a color, it could be a metal or a patina of another material. But once you've come up with the 10 color palette, as per this, and you can really see how these items are matched to the palette. Just showing you a few things. You can then use this as really great parameters for your design process. So this can help contain how you shop for furniture, paint, um, finishes, fixtures within your design. And it can help the client once you've left to keep layering and adding to their interior so that it's never static and stuck in one spot once the interior designer leaves. So coming up with the palette, you, I always stick them down. I like doing it in this kind of format. And it does give you a lovely sort of boundary to work in. It helps with how you choose your shapes, your fabrics, um, your marbles, any kind of stone finish, paint finish, metal finish. And it helps you have a beautiful considered thoughtful uh, end result. This is often how I'll start with the project too. It's a lovely way to build a relationship with the client. Um, it makes um, taking an interest in not just how they want to live or what they want to live with, but gives them an essence of them and their family and the things they love and often what they don't like. And it becomes very upfront and it is something that you can stick to throughout the journey of the, pro of the project. I have tried and tested this theory over the past decade and it has worked every time. And one of the beauties of it or the joys of it is how much the client loves working on it as well. So it's a really love, lovely connecting and relationship exercise on, you know, often a long journey of an interior design project. And I did write about it with my first book back in 2009 and it's right in the intro there. So we know it's been going for over a decade and does work. To show you another example, this is another palette that I came up with. These are for my paint range, but you can use these palettes or um, be inspired by them. But this one's called Atelier. And in this box, this was very much inspired by Paris in the 1920s. Um, and I gathered all sorts of things I thought would be found in that time. So we've got a beautiful old scallop shell. We've got some artists ink in here, 
As you can see, it's a very warm tone, an old Bakelite um, belt buckle, some milliner's um, flowers, again, ribbon. I have a very large ribbon collection, so they tend to hold color really beautifully, and I think it's a great representation. We've got some jet beads that you can imagine on a flapper dress. What else have we got in here? Oh, an old wax ornament, like a wax seal. Oh, this has got some fabulous things down the bottom here. I imagine that period in time is quite decorative as well. So there's some sort of objet trouvé or notions that might be found perhaps at the bottom of a handbag. Um, and then even a beautifully old packaged hairpin. There are more things in here, but this is a great representation of this sort of palette that I'll show you. Oh, even that's lovely. Even an old piece of pattern paper. I love this brownie kind of paper. And then I'll show you here. And what I love about the palette, so this palette you can see really picks up on these warm tones. But what I like to do within a palette, because you probably won't be using all 10 colors at once, but you could use some more neutral tones in one room and then you walk in and a bed heads in a really beautiful accent color. So you can use these in any combination throughout a whole entire house. They might go from the exterior, you might use glossy black in your lighting and then you go to a rendered wall that's in this beautiful torpy color and then you go into the colors as you get into the living spaces or do something really fabulous in a red marble in the, in the bathroom. Um, but it does give you a guideline to use throughout the project. So this is just a lovely way of how you color match. Like those jet beads are exactly like what I've called as chinoiserie as that color, as that paint color. And again, it's not just about paints, it's about patina and materials and textiles as well as color. So when you're doing this with a client, what I suggest is that they get a shoe box and you ask them to fill it with a minimum of 10 items that are important to them or things that they love and make suggestions. They could put a cocktail ring in there, an invitation, um, their favorite cup, morning coffee cup, um, a, a scarf, a pattern, because what happens is people are attracted to the same color and patterns over and over and over again. And when you do a box like this, it's quite quickly revealed what that palette is. So how you extract it is you lay everything out on the table and then you start grouping. And it is quite unbelievable how quickly their personality is revealed and how you can color match it with ease. This theory doesn't just come up with a palette, but it is a lovely way to cement a relationship with a client. And what can be revealed over a long journey of, of, a, of a project, with this, you can learn more about your client in an hour sitting with them talking about their favorite objects from whether they're a morning person, whether they don't like pink and other things that are important to them that give you a depth to a beautiful, unique, interior that they're going to love being in. So sharing with you my 10 color palette idea really is such a great starting point for any interior design project. So I hope you understand how I've translated an object into a color that then relates directly to how you pick your furniture, fittings and fixtures. You can join me now for a live Q&A.